Hello, everyone. My name is George Valdez. I'm your host, and I'm the head of marketing here at Monograph. We've got our final session coming up with a dear friend and partner of Monographs, Marjan Pearson. Marjan is a founder and chief strategy officer for Talent Star Inc., an icon in our industry, a literal behind the scenes player in some instances. Marjan is going to spend the next hour with us sharing her experiences and advice for how companies can grow. Successful firms have a foundation of purpose for who they are and what they do, as well as why it matters. And we're going to learn more, learn more about how we can all architect and design that foundation at our organizations. Marjan, welcome back to the Section Cut stage. Thank you, George. It's wonderful to be on it with you again. I love talking with you. And I'm delighted to be here today with everyone. I always love this because we know that fingerprints are special, that no one has the same fingerprint, and that, of course, it's being used for identification now. But what's interesting is that when we start talking about firms and about how firms grow, all firms are not alike, even offices of the same firm. When I first started working in architecture, I worked at SOM, and I was really surprised when I learned that the Chicago and New York offices of SOM were very different from the San Francisco office. And of course, it had to do, there was a purpose for the organization. There, there was a, a raison d'etre, the why we are in business. But because the leadership of each office was different, each office had a different way of manifesting who they were, what they did, how they did it and why it mattered. And so that stuck with me through all of the experiences that I've had throughout working within design firms and also now as a consultant with design firms. There's been a huge evolution of practice over the years um, and I'm not gonna go into details about that, but I'll share a little bit. Let's start out with what evolution even means. This is, this is what's called a seral stage of growth in an a single ecological community. So within one area of the forest, this is what's likely to occur over a period of time. And just like that, architectural firms grow. This came from the AIA Handbook of Professional Practice in 2014. And you can see that it shows the several stages of practice with the beginning as a sole proprietorship, moving into perhaps a partnership, then a corporation, the firm getting larger, et cetera, et cetera. And the different decisions that a firm might undertake over that period of time. This is an actual example. It's, it's not a specific firm. It's taken from a number of different firms that we've worked with that are in the um, 25 to 50 person range. But typically what happened is that there were founders, there was a founder or perhaps two or three. And then as key people joined the firm, they were key collaborators and named as associates or senior associates. And then at a point in time, the firm, as the firm grew, they might move into studios or departments or some kind of organization within the firm. And at some point in time, ownership transition would also occur. Firm might change its name or rebrand. And of course, there would be continuous growth in terms of the number of key collaborators, the associates, senior associates, and all of the members of the firm. There's also been a, a really high velocity of practice change over the last 10 years with much more merger and acquisition at the at the larger firm level. If you actually looked at a spectrum of firms, um, you would see that for the firms that are 50 to 100 or more, there's been more and more consolidation over the years, but not necessarily as much consolidation at the smaller firm level. This is taken from the AIA survey reports in 2012 and 2018. And what's interesting is that you can see that in the 10 to 49 person range, the, the share, there's a higher share, there's a great share of firms in between the one and 49. I mean, it's 94%. But you can also see that the share of staff has gotten progressively smaller. And you need to remember that 
what I understand is that AIA, 8AIA members are typically in firms of 15 or fewer people. More than 80% of AIA firms are 15 or fewer people. So there's been an increasing number, but a, a smaller share because the larger firms are growing more all the time. I'm particularly interested in the firms that are growing between 25 and say 75 people because what we have been seeing is that it's possible for those firms to act, to, to be smaller firms with a more personal identity and approach to the work that they're doing, but they're able to act larger. And a lot of that has to do with the, the infrastructure, with the information systems resources that have become available and particularly with the technology. Then when you add to it, what has happened in terms of social media, social platforms, publicity, it's no longer, we're no longer limited to our zip code. We can work anywhere with any kind of client in any possible location. And many, and many firms are doing that, working in multiple time zones all around the world. Oops, sorry. This is an example of how a firm might grow in terms of the number of shareholders. And this has accelerated. It's why I was talking about the velocity of practice, because what we're seeing is that this is happening with firms that are 10 or 15 years old, rather than what had traditionally been a 30 to 40 year arc of practice. And the whole point is that when you have an opportunity to begin the transition to move from working with the sole proprietorship to working together and then creating an opportunity for the, the original founders or, and owners of the firm to move to something beyond the firm, leaving the sustainability of practice in the hands of the second, third and fourth generations. The firm in which I became a partner a long time ago, back in 1979, is now in its 10th generation of, of ownership transition. Now that doesn't mean that it's been 20 years per generation, but basically every five years, they're moving towards the creation of the sustainability of their practice by adding more and more people to the ownership as others find either move out of the specific fiduciary responsibility of ownership and move forward into doing the design, doing things that they really wanna do, uh, not necessarily managing the firm. So there's a, this really interesting transition that has happened an evolution or even revolution that has happened in practice where it doesn't take as long to get to be in a true leadership position in a firm. Oops. And I was talking with one of my friends the other day. We were talking about this, the, the topic for the, the talk today. And she had been with Gensler for a really long time and, and has great admiration for Art Gensler, as do I. And she said, he always said, find people who are better than you and get out of the way. And that really is one of the best ways to be able to grow. It's one of the reasons why Gensler has been able to accomplish organic growth over the years without all of the merger and acquisitions that other firms have found as a, as a successful vehicle. So the question is, how can you build forward momentum? Because that's really what enables growth. Um, as Veronica was saying earlier today in one of the presentations, fabulous presentation, you know, we build our work on habits, the way we do the work, the way we work with people, every aspect of what we do and how we do it is built on habits. And it's hard to break a habit. And so you need to be able to find a way that you can get some forward momentum. What happens is that it comes from the leadership, it comes from, from everyone within the firm, hopefully. Hopefully it's cascading all the way around 
in every aspect of the firm. But if the builders aren't proponents, if the leaders aren't proponents, then it's likely that the habits won't change. And these are, this is from an article by Strategy and Business on the X factors of exceptional leaders. And I think it's really interesting because these are the things that we should be looking for at all levels of the firm. And, and particularly with anyone who is vested with a leadership responsibility. And it is vesting. It is something that can be adopted and it's something that can be given as well. So how do you measure sex today? Excuse me, success today. Thank you. Um, what's interesting is that behavior is typically measured based on past experience. I have a difficult time with the term best practice because just because something was a best practice of another firm in another point in time with another purpose doesn't mean that it's going to be a best practice for you. And what we all should be looking at is future potential. In the past, Vitruvius gave us the guidelines for architecture, firmness, commodity, and delight. But we've moved on from that. And part of moving on is to figure out what we could become, what could we do, how could we do it? particularly in an environment in which the future is unpredictable as we've experienced over the last couple of years. This is a quotation from Rita McGrath, the author of Seeing Around Corners, who is a professor of strategy at Columbia. And this is my guiding principle, that strategy is important, but it needs to be driven by real purpose which enables decision-making. Slightly different way of saying this, but I do believe that purpose is underlying everything. And so firmness, commodity, and delight, in my mind, is leading to this, purpose, values, and fulfillment. And you can see I posted my own little post-it on it, a quotation from Whitney Johnson saying that people today are bringing their dreams to work. And we're looking for purpose in everything that we do. We're bringing our values with us and we want to achieve fulfillment. Fulfillment is a huge metric of success today. This is from Great to Good, Jim Collins, great book if you haven't read it. Um, the hed hedgehog is, there's a, a discussion about the difference between the hedgehog and the fox. And the, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And what Jim Collins found was that the good to great companies were basically hedgehogs. They used their hedgehog nature to drive toward what, what would lead them to success. And as opposed to the foxes that never gained the clarifying advantage of the one big thing, and instead were scattered, diffused, and inconsist inconsistent. I think that's really interesting that ha having your idea about purpose and what drives you towards it enables you to focus and to find the sweet spot at the center of this particular diagram and for your practice. So today, purpose-based development is the foundation of dimensional value. It actually leads us in the direction of who we are, who we will become, what we do and what we will do, how we do it and how we may do it in the future and why it matters and why it will continue to matter. It is at the center of every aspect of our firm's strategy, organization process, culture, people in interaction, metrics and rewards. It drives everything and, and alignment is essential within the firm. It's also interesting because traditionally architectural firms have four, develop, four areas of developmental assets. Ideas or the intellectual capital, 
image, which is the symbolic capital, not only not just your logo, but of of everything that you do. For instance, um, CRS had a group of of people who worked with Willie Pena, the author of Problem Seeking, and they would go out to their client meetings carrying the those aluminum suitcases. And uh, my colleague Nancy Egan would say that they would leave the office and they would all you know, go marching out with their suitcases all ready to do the squatters programming sessions that were so important. But because they brought this symbolic capital in who they were, what they did, and how they did it, that it had more impact on their presence in the meeting. Networks, of course, relationship capital and capabilities, which is what enables us to do what it is that we want to do. So those are the four areas that are growth areas within a firm where you can actually invest. And then it's possible to design your future. At the beginning, I showed this, this Cyril Forest. This is a design by one of our clients, Series Plus Landscape Architecture in Colorado. And it's what you can do if you take a forest area and then design it. I'm, I'm not suggesting we should do this to all the forests, but it is truly beautiful. And it's frankly what we want to do with our firms at all, we, firms as well. We want to create this amazing firm that does remarkable work and gives everyone great joy. So what do you need to do? Integrated strategy. That means it's not up to two or three people to figure it out. We really recommend that you have a, a brain trust of people from throughout the firm, different generations, who begin to look at all the different aspects of strategy within the firm and, and then identify key issues, bring diverse and fresh viewpoints to it. And through all of that discussion, listening sessions, workshops, the entire process, create initiatives for accelerated growth and return on investment. And we also recommend that no firm can really undertake more than two or perhaps three initiatives at any point in time, because of course you wanna give it focus, going back to the hedgehog concept. And some basics for you, this is a diagram that starts with a concept out of the business school, market strategy, process, and organization. And you can see that at the center is management, on the left, you have a value proposition. That's not a vice president. That's the value proposition that you create. That's part of your strategy. You have go-to-market strategy at the top to figure out who you're going to work with, whether it's opportunities, clients, markets, or beyond. Operations next to process. And then organization, which is really where you invest in the future of the firm. There is a metabolic process that most firms use where almost 80% of the effort of leadership in the firm is focused on getting the work and doing the work. It's a huge amount, but without that, you don't have the funds to do whatever it is that you wanna be doing. What's interesting is that you can manage the outcome you can manage the profitability, but you aren't necessarily setting the stage for higher level of value and profitability for whatever you are doing in the firm. The other 20% is typically spent on the evolutionary process of the firm. And you can see that in this case, the turquoise arrow is moving from strategy over to organization. So the focus is on creation of value and creation of knowledge that increases your value so that you can find the, the right fit, the right alignment between the client that you wanna work with and what it is that you wanna do, create the right pricing strategy 
the right contract, the right scope, everything that you need to be able to do it, win the work and do the work. And what we found is that the firms that spend more time on strategy are actually doing better in terms of the, the metabolic process. They're doing better in terms of profitability, in terms of employee engagement, in terms of client satisfaction, in terms of increase of knowledge in every aspect of firm practice. The next slide shows the importance. Oop, it says skip this. And the answer was no. Um, the next step shows that in order to have a successful enterprise, you need to focus on your portfolio strategy. And that's actually a combination of clients, portfolio, and revenues. Who do you want to work with? What are you going to do? And how are you going to increase the value, the perceived value of what it is that you do? And this is a huge um, responsibility. It's typically outwardly focused, and yet it's using all kinds of internal resources and particularly resources in planning and strategy. This, and we're not skipping this one either. This is the process. This is the project and practice operations. The way that we're going to do the work, the how to do it, the how we're going to change the way we're doing it. Um, one of the sessions this morning was talking about developing all of the, the tools and standards and, and practices that are necessary. And I know that a lot of people attending this program are focused on that. It is just as important as getting the work. You really do need to figure out what you want to do, how you want to do it, and find opportunities to update, upskill, change along the way. This is from the, uh, an article from First Round Review on the arc of company life. And it shows the, the baseline curve this curve, it shows the, the typical progression of a firm from the time that somebody starts it until the time they lock the door and walk out of the office. But that doesn't have to be because there are new trajectories, there are new optionalities that occur, opportunities to make change. It may be a, a key change, for instance, in singing and in music, we're accustomed to hearing key changes in the music where there's modifications, modulations of what it is that we're doing. But there are also opportunities to make major changes and developing trajectories by using initiatives in order to achieve what it is that you want to do over a period of time. And this shows two different examples. One on the left where you focus on client diversification, leadership succession, professional expertise, execution capabilities, which is more related to practice combined with an enterprise strategy. But then the enterprise strategy begins to look at where do you want to be? Where is the opportunity? Who should we be developing in terms of relationships? What segments, what adjacent spaces should we be looking at? What is happening to our clients? And how can we be ahead of our clients in whatever it is they will need to do with their businesses. How can we help them create success, not just today, but tomorrow? Services and products, etc. So in order to focus on creating the future, you need to envision your future. It's a workshop, a series of workshops, not just a one day, one hour event. You need to look at designing the trajectories. And sometimes you have to back past them, which means you have to figure out what you want to be doing. And then you have to figure out the trajectories that are going to lead to it. Embrace change and transformation. And, and determine together how to mobilize your resources to achieve it. Because you do need to get everyone onto the bus with you. And that all leads to smart growth. Um, this is a new book that's out. It's actually about individuals, how to grow people in order to grow your company. But it's a great list for any firm. Taking the right risks, 
having the opportunity to take the right risks. Because if you don't know what they are, then you can't make the decision to take them. We already understand playing to our distinctive strengths. That's, that's who we are. Embracing constraints, finding opportunities within the constraints. And again, one of the speakers earlier was talking about um, a, a client that possibly doesn't want to spend as much money on a project as you would really like them to. But if you can embrace that and develop a win, then that's a win that you have put into your portfolio that is going to lead you to, to further um, success. So this is a terrific list. I recommend that you all consider it. And now Brian hopefully is putting into the chat window. At the beginning, I asked you when you thought of growth, what did you, what did you think of? And typically people think about growth in terms of numbers. And I put some words on the left-hand side that related more to measurable growth. But on the right-hand side, I included some words that I really like that have more developed metal and dimensional um, definitions. In particular, I love alchemy. I love the idea of transformation as a metric of change and a metric of growth. And it doesn't necessarily mean changing base metals into gold, but isn't that what you're doing when you grow a firm? I think so. So you're on the launching point. These are the questions you need to ask. And remember that you can grow successfully when you take the right risks. This is my friend, Lisa Bottom, who was talking with me about Gensler the other night. She's terrific. And now we're at Q&A, George. George? <laughs> I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm making my way up to the stage. Uh, I mean, as always, just kind of like a just a mind-blowing uh, presentation. I think everyone in the audience will agree. Um, and we do have a couple questions, actually, from the audience that I'll kind of share here. So I think uh, earlier on, when you were talking about uh, the evolution of leadership, uh, moving from sole proprietorship over to uh, because the sustainability, what was it? The sustainability of sustainability of the of the firm or the practice of the firm, right? The kind of ongoing leadership. Um, you mentioned a little bit that now it seems like people are crossing to leadership sooner, and I think part of the question was wondering about in terms of like the average number of years, like how long does it take for either folks to go from that sole proprietorship to that uh, that. Uh, kind of model of handing off to multiple generations or um, is that shrinking too or are you seeing that more at the individual level where people are becoming leaders and firms sooner in their career? That's a good question. The more hierarchical the firm, the more likely it is it's going to take longer. And now that we are moving to a more distributed form of leadership, particularly over the last two years when we have the whole model of practice has changed dramatically with so many people no longer being in the office, taking on more responsibility, higher level of communication and trust throughout the organization. It's, I think that there are opportunities today for, for firms to take the lead. I do think that it's happening. And I just have to say, when I became a partner at the firm that is today called RMW, the founding partners had started it eight years before. They were in, they were 40 and 41 when they began their ownership transition. And we were 30, 31 to 35. Wow. So an, enough younger, but it wasn't the generation of change. And I think that that's really the important thing. A generation is 18 to 20 years. And that's about how long it used to take to get to be an owner in a firm. And there are firms today that are looking for the, the best talent and recognizing that the sooner they grow that talent, they allow the talent to grow, 
to take on leadership, to move forward, then the faster the firm will grow as well. And again, Gensler is a great example of this. You know, you have to be within the firm for a couple of years to be considered for principal, but you don't have to be 45 years old. And they actually have a, an accelerated path of leadership and encourage everyone in the firm to participate in community organizations, which not only allows them to create networks, but it also gives them opportunities to take on leadership roles and responsibilities, which then is valuable in this continuing growth. So it's not just related to the firm, it's really related to advocacy, to community development, which is part of the practice community development, but also part of the, the larger venue outside the firm. Would you say that um, part of what you describe when it comes to like community development can be tied back to what you were talking about when it came to developmental assets? In other words, like one potential way to fast track is if someone joins a firm and is very good at you know, maybe multiple, like developing multiple of those, the, the quadrant of intellectual symbolic relationship or implementation, but just really good, let's say a relationship building, that that's one way in which one can fast track themselves through the firm, just building a great network of uh, clients and collaborators. Well, absolutely. And uh, it's not only business development, but it's also in terms of the collaborations that, what, that a firm needs for, who else will work with you, who else will be interested in what it is that you're doing, and the ability to connect with people in the various client sectors so that, so that you actually understand more about what the client does than perhaps the client themselves. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me, particularly um, since, since I'm a boomer, um, is, is talking with my niece who's 41 and then with even younger children of my friends who uh, are in their 20s to 30s. And th there's a completely different sensibility about networking, you know, lots of networking, lots of social interaction. Um, I mean, I can remember, it's, it's interesting because I grew up in a period of time when it was unethical to send out postcards saying that mm. you had gotten a big project. It was, you would be called up before the AIA on ethics charges. And now that's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no one can even believe it. But it was the case up into the 90s. And so there's a whole new generation with friends who are doing all kinds of things, a lot in technology, other professional services that are fearless about mm. things that architects have traditionally been more fearful about or, or more, more um, introspective about. And that's making a huge difference. So it, it's really an opportunity to take advantage of your talents and find ways not only to build your own career, but to find the right practice firm group of people with whom you can build it. Yeah, I think there's also, I mean, there's so many conversations. I think you and I have had this conversation before too, but there's uh, frequent conversations I have with other folks about just, you know, the assumptions have changed, right? The, un under which so many things have been built on the habits uh, that Veronica was talking about uh, in, in her previous uh, conversation. You know, it's now like, you know, that postcard now is basically an Instagram post. Yeah. That is like, can be seen and it's, shared. And a and TikTok video. <laughs> or a TikTok video, which pretty quickly can, you know, and I think, you know, what, what, what hasn't necessarily latched on yet is this idea that, you know, uh, relationship building sort of starts with audience building at this point now, because before it was so difficult to build an audience around your work. You really had to network with uh, people at Architects Record, Architectural Record, or, you know, you had to like figure out 
those existing networks for dist distributing your work in some sense. But now it's it's completely changed, right? You can open up a TikTok and just as long as you understand the dynamics of TikTok, you can build a relationship or at least an audience at first with a whole millions of people that are interested in the work that you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that that's one of those things that can be easily overlooked by a firm that doesn't necessarily understand yet how, how deeply those assumptions have changed about how, you know, e even your client's sensibilities have changed, right? They're not searching uh, through normal channels anymore. They might not even be Googling anymore. They might be completely like uh, on Instagram and they get an ad on Instagram from a firm that's like doing really interesting work. They end up following them and then, you know, so forth and so forth. But it's just fun. It's, it's interesting to layer that other piece of it. It's just like how much has changed and how that should inform the strategy of the firm as it moves yeah. into the future. And it's one of the things that Brian McDaniel, who's our partner, who's responsible for communications, um, it's one of the things that he works with firms on because often there's the idea that Instagram is your storefront and that you want it to be, you know, absolutely perfect. But the reality is that what the firms that are successful in recruiting are, are raising the curtain, you know, and, mm, and they're, they're talking about what it's like to work there. Having videos, not necessarily the most professional videos, but having people on the website or on TikTok, whatever, talking about how, how they are creating success, why they enjoy what it is that they're doing. There's, there's a huge movement. Now that's different from relationship building because relationship building has to do with something that, that has meaning on both sides and not just image. You know, the social platforms have to do more with the image that you're projecting as opposed to true relationships in terms of interactions. But it's interesting because I know a lot of people are saying that it's difficult to do that today where we haven't been able to go out and meet people. I have partners that I've never met in person. Brian, I've never met in person. And we've known each other, I think it's 20 years, 25 years, something like that. And I love working with him and we have a relationship, you know? So if, I, if we can do it, anybody can do it. And you can do it pretty much anywhere in the world these days. We have clients from Panama that are on the, I think are watching right now too. There, um, another question did come up uh, from Mia. What are, what are your thoughts on, because um, I, I think your presentation really showed a lot of amazing visuals and sometimes these, gra these uh, diagrams are really effective tools to unpack complicated ideas. And one, one tool that Mia is bringing up is this, uh, it's called the business model canvas. Um, what are your thoughts on using that? I think Mia has expressed like it's been really helpful for her um, in the past. And and I, I'm, Mia, thank you. And I hope that you can put some more in the chat window for everyone. You know, when I first read, the first time I read about the, the business model canvas was in um, Blue Ocean Strategy. And there was an example of Cirque du Soleil when it was just getting started and how they use the business model canvas in order to figure out how they could be different from other circuses. And if you haven't read Blue Ocean Strategy, either go to the HBR article or go to the book because it's an amazing story and valuable for any, any kind of business, but especially design businesses. And I think it's, I think it's really good. I think that the, the, the categories in the standard one are not necessarily the same categories that are necessary or, or as relevant as they could be for design practice. But I think that if you go through and figure out what the equivalent is or what, what the different option is, then it can be really very useful. Um, we've used it with with a luxury hospitality design firm that had a very difficult time figuring out how to apply it. But I know that uh, Tom McKay, who's another one of our colleagues, has, has used it very successfully with some modifications. Yeah, as a tool, that one seems like 
you know, when you think about strategy, that one is so much about almost like just undoing all the plumbing, right? I mean, when you use that tool, you're really kind of like blank slate. So the larger of a firm you are, probably a tool like that becomes like almost paralyzing because what you're doing as an exercise might be, you know, you could probably diagram what it is today, but when you start to sort of see where, where the shifts need to happen, it can be a pretty, uh, I don't know, it could be revealing in that sense, right? The exercise is still valuable. It's just like the, uh, bringing it to action might be, might be tough sometimes. Yeah, sometimes it is, it can be really hard to figure out what does that mean? And, mm -hmm. and that's when you may need to talk with, you know, especially if you're starting up, you may need to talk to whoever one of your mentors is in a, in a firm that has, you know, that has a little bit more experience than you or someone who's coming out of a completely different industry, somebody coming out of technology or, or medicine or something where you can talk about what the, what the comparatives are and, uh, and then extrapolate from that. Me, me also had another question here. If you can give an example or two of the right risks you've seen companies mm. make. Oh, that's, that's a tough one. Well, I, I mean, again, I'll go, I'll go to a really basic one, which is, which used to be more of an issue than it is today, which is, should you open an office? in a specific location. I mean, that was always a risk issue. And I can remember an article in the Harvard Business Review, and this is probably from 30 years ago, saying that you not only had needed to have the strategy for how to get in it in the first place, but you had to have a strategy for when do you get out? Hmm. Because the biggest risk is continuing to do something, continuing to knock your head against the wall lose money, not getting what you wanted to do in the first place. And you're continuing to put good money after bad instead of taking a break, looking at a better way of investing and taking the risk of stepping out of something. And I think that's a really good example. The other, the other big risk that's going on right now is talent because firms, um, everybody's hiring, but firms tend to hire for specific roles as, a, as opposed to investment positions. You know, when you find somebody who's really talented but isn't really a, the right fit and it's a risk, you know, are you willing to invest that funding in bringing the person in in order to create an opportunity that you might not otherwise have? So those are two that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, the last one's great, right? It's like, how do you invest on potential? Yeah. Which, Which is, is difficult. where it is, but you know, how many known things are there in our business? <laughs> and Apple, Apple's a good investment. <laughs> you know, that also reminds me of, of one, one sort of story about uh, sort of taking a big a risk that, put, would, that turned out to be right at a very large organization was like the story of Facebook moving to mobile. Um, then basically it was a complete, like imagine thousands of employees being told that they're gonna stop working on anything related to do with the web, with a website, or let's say your kind of service that you're doing, let's say you're doing a uh, commercial, right? And that's your bread and butter and say, no, we're gonna pivot to residential or something, yeah. right? Because that's, yeah. that's what we need to do right now. That's the kind of crazy risks that you see, you know, that paid off really well for them. But like that, that takes a lot of, you know, the strategy has to be really sound um, on that front. Or at least identified, you know, we've talked before about the future, the idea of a future council, which I called a brain trust today. Mm -hmm. But but having having get togethers periodically where with with people who are in the leadership of that, but can bring other people into the tribe to think about what's happening in the world. You know, before 2020, we were all thinking about, oh, 2020 is gonna be a big change year. Well, yes, it was, it was a horrible change year. But now we should be looking not at 2023, we should be looking at 2025. And 
yes, we have the 2030 initiative for sustainability, but what are our clients going to be doing in 2030? And to, in order to manage the risk, we need to do the research and the thinking and potentially find a way to lead the way. Hmm. And I think we, we're almost at time, but I do want to end with this one last question here um, um, about basically, we talked a little bit about finding the right talent, making the right investment on potential. Do you have any maybe go-to questions or like when you think about what does it mean to hire for potential, what are some of the attributes or characteristics that you're trying to tease out of that interview? Oh, that's, that's, a, that, that's an interesting thing. I always, first of all, I always listen for what's not being said. But what I want to know is how somebody thinks. I want to know, you know, if, if and, and, and often what you have to do is to, is to do it with theoreticals. I mean, you can say to someone, were you ever in a situation where you had a really great idea and you wanted to move it forward and what happened to it? What did you do? How did you, who, how did you form an alliance? Or if I'm talking with someone who says, oh, you know, there was a problem with this particular firm and, and I had a lot of great ideas, but nobody wanted to do anything. And then the question is, well, how did you try to change that? How did you form a coalition or find allies who would help you find a different path to do what it was that you thought was valuable? Or how did you find a way to express it? And the more questions, the more situational kinds of questions that you can ask, I think the more information you get from people. Yeah, I mean, this has been a fantastic conversation, Marjan. As always, thanks again. It's my pleasure. You know, I love working with all of you. And I was really pleased to be invited. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you soon.